Okay. And I'm gonna start the webinar. Y'all can keep chatting while we wait too, if you want. Okay. And yeah, we're just gonna wait for people to join us and then we'll get started. I gotta be careful about what I put in, you know, on the record, so. <laughs> People are joining fast. I don't think we'll have to wait that long. All right, cool, cool, cool. Yona Harvey can't be here. She told me to tell you hi, though. Oh, she's man. teaching. She's teaching tonight. She should have put me up on the screen. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's true. That's you true. ain't got to teach? No. <laughs> I love Yona, man. That's that's people's right there. Yeah, yeah. All right, why don't we get started? Um, good evening. Welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Shani from Greenlight, and I'm thrilled to be hosting tonight's event with Roger Reeves, presenting his new book, Best Barbarian. He'll be talking with A. Van Jordan, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Roger, Van, and the team at Norton for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things in our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. Um, they can see that you're here, though, and there are a couple of ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon, where you're welcome to post your thoughts and your comments. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. Um, Tonight's featured book, Best Barbarian, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, or you can order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. As a thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we're offering 10% off the featured book. Just enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout. And I'll be putting that in the chat later tonight, too. So our interviewer tonight is award-winning poet A. Van Jordan. Jordan is the author of four poetry collections, most recently The Cineast. His other books include Quantum Lyrics, Magnolia, and Rise. Jordan has been awarded a Whiting Writers Award, um, an Annisfield Wolf Book Award, and a Pushcart Prize. He's also a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a United States Artist Fellowship, and a Lennon Literary Award in Poetry. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Roger Reeves. Roger is the author of King Me and the recipient of a National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship, a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation, and a 2015 Whiting Award, among other honors. His work has appeared in Poetry, The New Yorker, The Paris Review, and elsewhere. He lives in Austin, Texas. Roger's new book, Best Barbarian, probes the apocalypses and raptures of humanity, climate change, anti-Black racism, familial and erotic love, ecstasy, and loss. The poems in Best Barbarian roam across the literary and social landscape from Beowulf's Grendel to the jazz musician Alice Coltrane, from reckoning with immigration at the US-Mexico border to thinking through the fraught beauty of the moon on a summer night after the police have killed a black man. Roger is going to start us off with a reading from the book and then he'll be talking with Van and with all of you. So please take it away, Roger. Grendel. All lions must lean into something other than a roar. James Baldwin, for instance, singing Precious Lord. His voice is weary as water broken over his scalp in a storefront sanctified church's baptismal pool all those years ago when he wanted to be somebody's child and on fire in that being. Lord, I want to be somebody's child and chosen water spilling over their scalp, water taking the shape of their longing, a deer diving into evening traffic in the furrow drawn in the air over the hood of the car, power, and wanting to be something alive and open. Lord, I want to be alive and open, a glimpse of power, the shuffle of a mother's hand over a sleeping child's forehead as if clearing the city's rust from its face. 
which we mostly are, a halo of rust, a glimpse of power. James Baldwin leaning into the word light, his voice jostling that single grain as if he might drop it or already has. I'm calling to that grain of light, to that gap between his teeth, where the many of us fatherless sleep and bear and be whatever darkness or leaping thing we can be. In James Baldwin's mouth, my difficult beauty, my weak and worn, my future as any number of angels, which is not unlike the beast Grendel, coming out of the wild heaven into the hills and halls of the meat house at the harpist call, with absolute prophecy in his breast and desire for mercy for an end, a friend to drifting in loneliness. And in that coming down out of the hills, out of the trees for once, bringing humans the best vision of themselves, which of course must be slaughtered. Thank y'all for coming out. Uh, it's awesome to read from the book. I uh, appreciate Van being here, being an interlocutor, being a, uh, you know, I've been sort of in conversation with Van for probably about 14, 15 years now uh, in terms of poetry. And thank you, Greenlight Books, for having me. I probably won't say much in terms of the poems right now, just reading. Cocaine and gold. I never wanted to be this far into the business of heaven, chasing my father hunting his soul in the corn in confusion of this harvest. My father who is hidden in the last sheaf of heaven, maybe heaven itself. My father, the corn wolf, who we must kill but is already dead. We will learn nothing here of sacrifice or the cocaine of beauty. My hands chattering in eulogy, which is a search for order, which is nothing but the elimination of beauty by artifice. By artifice, we cauterize my father's drifting life. A minor cosmetic surgery, like liposuction. A funeral is an elimination of nature by artifice. By artifice, do you repeat yourself? Very well then, I repeat myself as heaven as a golden harvest, as a broken ocean of corn. The search for beauty is the elimination of death, which requires dying, which is the business of farming, which no one cares to do anymore in America. And like dying, we'd rather rent it out. Freedom without freedom, to hold your dying father up to a razor beneath a golden light and cut him finally in and out of the world. And the last poem I'll read is Children Listen. It turns out, however, that I was deeply mistaken about the end of the world. The body in flames will not be the body in flames, but just a house fire ignored. The black sails of that solitary burning boat rubbing along the legs of lovers flung into a Roman sky by a carousel. The lovers too sick in their love to notice a man drenched in fire on a porch or a child aflame mistaken for a dog, mistaken for a child running to tell of a bomb that did not knock before it entered in Gaza with its glad tidings of abundant joy. In Kazmira's a god is weeping in a window, one golden hand raised above his head as if he slipped on the slick rag of the future. Our human kindnesses, unremarkable as the flies, rubbing their legs together while standing on a slice of cantaloupe. Children, you were never meant to be human. You must be the grass. You must grow wildly over the grave. Beautiful, Roger. Thank you, man. Thanks, man. Thank you. So um, 
I just wanted to, to say uh, what an honor it is to, to talk to you about this, this book today, man. Um, I know we've, we've talked a little bit about it, but um, it's, it's great hearing you read it. I'm glad you uh, put that voice out uh, to get us started here, kind of blessing us with that. Um, you know, there's so much here. And um, the thing that I was struck by in, in reading the book, uh, not only about the, uh, the beauty of it and the emotion within it, uh, but also the beauty of the structure, um, the craft of it all. Um, you know, there's so much happening uh, around themes of, of loss and of uh, projecting the future. Um, and, you know, we talked a bit about how you know, uh, in the process of writing this book over some time too, you just, you took your time with it and you put your foot in it as well. So it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing, man. Um, but I also wanted to say like, you know, so you, you took your time with it and in that, in that, over that time, uh, you became a father and shortly after that, you lost your father. And so I wanted to talk a bit about how you managed to deal with, um, uh, the emotion in the book and writing about that and um, and also just kind of thinking about uh, the ways in which you're able to kind of wrap your mind around, um, you know, the, the subject matter and the emotion um, and the different connections you make, all these different strands that you braid together in this uh, on a craft level. But first, um, a bit about you know, just thematically, like how you entered this book, what was happening in your life, um, how it came together for you. Sure. Uh, great question. Um, it's interesting because I was just writing a bunch of poems after my second book. You know, you just, I'm just writing poems. And oh. it was around, so my father passes uh, a month after my daughter turns one. And I find out on my first father's day. So I find out on like that day, I get a call. He has, he has a, and one of the things that I think was re, was really interesting was I had already been sort of experiencing an aesthetic upheaval after having my daughter because I was like I was watching her grow and watching her become a person, and I thought, oh, she's she's doing it already. She's already like being an artist, and I was like, oh, I need to learn from her because she's like sort of already living the artist life. And then simultaneously, my dad passes. And when my dad passed, when I started writing again, probably shortly after, every poem was about him for about a year and a half, maybe two years. Like, I would be thinking I'm writing about this thing over here, and it would just come back to my dad. And I would, and for a while, I just leaned into that and just, just wrote every, I just wrote lots of poems, wrote this sort of document that's probably about 60 pages of just things I was thinking about elegy, um, things that connected to other elegies and ways of thinking about beauty, from Wallace Stevens to Gwendolyn Brooks. I was just contending with all these different ways that people have talked about it. But then I wrote Children Listen. And when I wrote Children Listen, which was probably almost a year and a half, two, year and a half, almost two years after my father passed, that's when I saw that I had a second book. And it was like, that was the first poem that announced to me, oh, this is the book. But I didn't know where my father would figure into it because I was also sort of resisting, even as I was writing about my father, I was discontent sort of with the, the I, the capital I, the, the perspective coming from, from the self because I didn't want a solipsistic I, which is what I felt like I'd been seeing a lot of solipsism. Um, and I just, so I resisted it. And, and then I was reading David Ferry and I became in conversation with David Ferry, not just his poems, but him, and I started realizing that this eye is a thousands, thousands of years old. Um, you know, uh, it goes back to the epic. Uh, it goes back to like Gilgamesh, like Sumerian texts, right? And so I was just, it, that was the moment where I realized that. And so trying to contend with it, I, I just sort of plucked moments out of those many pages that I thought actually worked as poems. Um, and then once I began to do that, I began to think about them as, being something other than just about the emotion of losing my father, which was how do we ex explore um, myth, right? The corn wolf, right? Um, how do we explore 
um, or even like connecting it to like Gilgamesh um, and thinking about when he tries to touch his lover Enkidu in the, in the afterlife and Enkidu doesn't want to be touched by him because the rats are eating. And I was thinking about how, what it is to want to touch someone that is, that is past and what would happen if you meet them, right? And they come to you, right? What is the conversation? So all of that became a way of sort of uh, moving the emotion into something larger. Um, and also I needed to sort of work through some things so that I could actually be closer to my daughter. Uh, there's a way in which certain types of grief um, can sort of get in the way of intimacy. Uh, particularly if we, you know, I, I realized like in, in my daughter being born and my dad dying, like, oh, I'm next, right? Like I'm no longer a child. So, that's not yeah, as, as my, as I tell my nephew, you know, if everything works out, um, you know, you'll, you'll be bearing, you know, the rest of us, you know, and so, um, but, you know, you, you, you said something about grief uh, getting in the way of, of intimacy. And, you know, I wonder about that, you know, we talked a bit about how um, my, you know, my third book, uh, I wrote that while I was also losing my dad. And the thing that, you know, sometimes it's a big surprise is that there's this, you lose a, a person in your family, um, you know, a parent, a sibling, and you realize there's this kind of emotional room that's inside you that hasn't been opened before. And then suddenly you discover it, the door is flung open and you're trying to figure out like, where has this always been and how does this fit into the rest of my life? Um, but in your case, you know, the, the having um, Naima come into the world and into your life at the time that you're losing your father while you're becoming the father. Um, the, the thing that I love here is that you have that tension, you know, it, it, that play throughout the, the collection. And, um, you know, there's this um, wonderful structure to the book. Uh, you, you, you open with, with Grendel and in there you evoke Baldwin and then Baldwin comes back around a couple of times, you know, and, and certainly by the end, um, even echoes of him uh, in the last line of, of, the, of the collection, you know, and so um, can you talk a bit about uh, the structuring of, of the collection and um, just the way in which you pull these different strands together and braid them and uh, come up with this, uh, what, what, what some might think at times uh, is being kind of disparate, but actually like when, when you pull them together and use them in the context of, of this collection, uh, it's so clear that um, they are connected. Um, so can you talk a bit about just your, your thought process around the structure? Sure. There, there's many ways that like this book is structured. So I'll talk about the larger structure and then talk about sort of some of the threads. So one of the larger structure is I was looking for a metaphor. I was looking for like a way to put together the book. Because uh, for me, I, I love making tables. I'm not an interior designer, which I think is what putting the book together is. Right, like you interior designer when you. No, when you say table. tables, you mean like tables, like. Like what I mean is the metaphor is I'm a craft. Like I like to make a table. Right? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Table, right, so I make the poem. That's the table, right? Okay. But then all of a sudden, you you've made like sixty tables, right? And people are like, "What are you gonna do with those tables?" And you're like, "Oh, I guess I need to put these tables in the house, right?" Or I've made I've made better metaphors. I've made a table. I've made a chair. I made a couch. I have all these sort of uh, art objects slash furniture, right? Uh -huh. And I need to arrange them. And so one of the best pieces of advice that I think I finally understand was actually from a poet, Jericho Brown. And Jericho always says like, hey, you need to have a metaphor when you're building your book, right? And in this, in my first book, the metaphor was a water hose. Like I thought right. of it, like the structure was turn right. the faucet, on. you know, you turn the, the thing that, and it just, just full bore all the poems come. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But this one, the metaphor is jazz. Um, and what I mean by that is I was thinking about the structure of a jazz song. So if we think about like the first section, right, the first 20 poems or so, there's 20 poems, a one poem section, another one poem section, then another 20 poem section. That structure to me reminds me of jazz. And what I mean by that is the melody, right? If we think about like my favorite things or any of the like pre-free jazz sort of songs, right? 
it's there's a melody da 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 right and then we take those same key changes those same uh sort of keys and we begin to create our own song so that's the two individual poems that are about eight pages long right so they're the yeah. solo they're the they're the moment of improvisation where i'm improvising off of the melody so a lot of the things that are that are that we find in the poems reconvene in domestic violence and then and, and to me that's the moment and like I play jazz in college and one of the things is when you're taught to solo you're supposed to tell a story right the, the goal is yeah, to I don't know if everybody knows you play trumpet yeah yeah I play trumpet I play piano and you're supposed to tell a story but another way to think about impro improvisation is the next improvised slash poem which is something about John Coltrane which is this is the space like the melody becomes the, ter the territory and it's uh -huh. free uh, Ornette Coleman would say, the jazz saxophonist Ornette Coleman, we adventure off from that. So we don't have to like sort of be citing that anymore. That was the base and now we go off and find other places and ways of expression. So in some ways it's kind of, I would say uh, in an interview he did with uh, Derrida, he talks about sort of making part of the song extinct. Like you can no longer go back and play that because what you have found is something new. Right, so that's what's something about John Coltrane, which is also me uh -huh. talking to Alice Coltrane, uh -huh. uh, thinking about Elegy, because Alice Coltrane's song, Something About John Coltrane, comes out after John Coltrane's death. Yeah. Right? Um, so there's a way in which that's Elegy and Ode in some ways. And then we go back in the last section, which starts with Ode to, um, Ode to Neruda's Ode to a Lemon, right, which is a weird sort of way. It's like an Ode to an Ode. Um, yeah. And we're beginning that melody that's similar to the first 20 poems, right? But there's also little differences. So for instance, there's an incomplete absidarian in the first section. Which I love, yeah. And there's a complete absidarian in the last section, but there it completes itself through what I would call a kind of fugitivity, right? Because it's uh -huh. it's like go doing the ABC and then it kind of goes off, finds the thing, well, then it comes back it comes because back, it's trying yeah. to play with, you know, drop it to mania, which is this notion that uh -huh. uh, when, when black folks ran away from slavery, they did it because they were, they had a mental disorder, not because they wanted freedom, but it was a mental disorder. So I was playing with this idea of dropping to mania as a type of poetics. Like what would it be to make a poem that's quote unquote fugitive, that's lost its mind. Um, and so those are some of the strands, ways of thinking about structure and strand. And I could talk more even about like, you know, there's a father and son in domestic violence. And in fact, it's based on book six of the Aeneid, which, uh father looking for a son looking for a father in the afterlife and that sort of same thing is happening but it's reversed uh a, a, a son or a father finds a son in the afterlife and domestic violence so it's it's playing there's lots of different strands that are you know people can and but it's just kind of like also it's just like the way i think about like the music right to me yeah. it's poetry and the music of like the history of poetry and i think hip-hop does this you know mm -hmm. hip -hop, there's all types of citations you know people bringing back biggie big pun dmx they'll bring back something talib said you know like it's mm -hmm. all about how we riff and play so to me it's all play yeah 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 so you know when you when you mentioned the uh, the connection to jazz um it wasn't something that i i i saw you know immediately looking at the at the collection but then I started thinking about the ways in which, um, you know, all the different connections in the in the collection were um, uh, coming together and they kept surprising me, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, opening with Grendel and then finding Baldwin there was a surprise, you know, um, going through and, um, you know, finding um, Stevens, you know, was a surprise, you know, and then uh, with Emmett Till. You know, what I mean, and so you 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 have these things that you bring together in this um, in, inventive, um, uh, beautiful way. But at the same time, the thing that that it, it really seems to represent is um, uh, the, it, it represents the creative imagination, um, uh, the capaciousness of the black imagination. You know, because you know it's kind of like with Baldwin, not Baldwin, uh, Du Bois, with the double consciousness. And you're thinking about, you know, having um, this understanding, um, you know, we both teach in English departments, so we know, um, you know, there is um, this, you have to have this kind of 
clear understanding of literature through this white lens, mm. but we are, we're constantly sort of filtering it through the black experience, right? And holding it up, uh, you know, against that. And so we see that in this collection, like you, you managed to, to do that um, in a way that, um, that feels very authentic, mm. you know? And I think a lot of that, a lot of what makes it authentic is um, you ground it in your, your personal experience. And you sort of invite us in uh, to that as well. Um, when you think about um, just the process of writing it and thinking like, you know, all these different, um, you know, poems that seem like they might um, venture out beyond the interiority of, of Roger Reeves, um, when do you decide in those poems that you're going to bring in um, the, the interiority, bring in the personal? That's a good question. It, it's, it's interesting. So there's a poem, I want to talk about a poem that most people won't think of as citing anything because oh. of the way it's built. So um, there's a poem called After Death. Um, yeah. And um, if you look, so this is this only I know this, and there's no reason you anybody else will know this. But each image prior to the eye is an Andrew Wyeth painting. What? So, that's what I'm talking about. See? So, like, for instance, like, but you know, like, that's just the way, but that's the way I kind of like build things. Uh, so, if you like, for instance, let me get, let me pull it up real quick. So, it's on page 39. So, if you, if you, Andrew Wyeth is considered sort of a really amazing painter, really amazing painter. His dad was a, a draftsman and calligrapher, and like, and he comes from this, like, but he was like considered. At the before we sort of have this like post impressionist, we have this sort of um, big boom with like abstractionism, oh. right? Uh, Andrew Wyeth was like it. And what's funny, what's interesting to me is Andrew Wyeth grew up in Pennsylvania. I grew up in New Jersey, so there's the tie, but he grew up near this really old independent black town in Pennsylvania. And so some of his friends, so some of the people hmm. he paints in the early 20s were black people. Wow. And he talks about growing up with black people and does really interesting paintings of black. And this is like a white, like, you know, white, white master, one of the great oh. white painting masters. Right. And so I found his work and it was just really beautiful to me. But it was also really sort of it had a surrealist feel. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes, like if you look at his painting, I've done some, re you know, some reading on him. I know this is deep in the weeds. No, uh, go, go there. He'll, he'll put like a dog. And like he'll make a log look like a dog simultaneously, but it's still like hella like naturalist, right? So he wants to combine, he wants to like show that the, the edge of a log is dangerous, right? Like the teeth on a log. And so he has all these little things, or he'll just not include a piece of silverware on the table. And all of a sudden, the silverware feels like strange in this sort of surrealist way. Hmm. Um, so when I was, uh, it's not after funerals, after, after, what's that? Where is it? Um, I'm sorry. I want to pull it up the right one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's on page 44. Sorry, just in case people are. Uh, so, saying not to say, if you go by each line, right, to get the light. I'm sorry, this is after death, right? Yeah, after death. So, to okay. get the light dead coming through the window without distinguishing one from the other. So, that literally is an Andrew Wyeth painting where you see light coming through the window. And to me, it looked like the dead coming through, right? Mm -hmm. um, then the then he has these fields of these he has these beautiful paintings of fields. Then he has the painting actually of a man standing a black man standing beneath two scythes, and it looks like he's standing beneath death's scythe and he's drunk. And he has all the like also up until even the boy in the snow, all of the all everything was really an Andrew. So this is really an ekphrastic poem that nobody would see as ekphrastic, right? Um, but saying all that, I I got to. Hair the boy who turns a skunk over with a stick, watching the Christmas of its intestines steam in the stove, death touching the boy. Now that's me adding some stuff. And then, desire is everywhere in this field. And I was like, where do I turn? Oh, it's me, right? And then I turned to, and I was like, who's watching this? It's me. So there's a way in which there, it could seem as if the, the poem is just this observer, but I wanted to show that the images were, or what we are receiving is actually coming from a body that has concerns and therefore is reading death in this way. And why is he, why is this speaker reading death in this way? It's because he's looking out these windows and he's dealing with his daughter, thinking about his daughter, thinking about his father, right? Um, and actually 
the like I didn't have these windows. This is where the imagination takes over. I didn't have windows like this to look out into a field, but it reminded me of a of window of a documentary by Wendell Berry and where he writes. Yeah. So I met. So to me, this is like a combination of playing uh, with like many things at once. So the, to me, the turn to the personal is when clearly there's a point of view, and that point of view yeah. needs to sort of break through and yeah. actually give what the tension is in all these sort of images. Yeah, 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 man. So you know, the, you you're kind of reinventing the ecrastic there because you, yeah. you're using it as an influence. Uh, as a prompt for movement in the poem, um, but not having it about the art that's influencing it. Which, which, is, is, which yeah. is kind of what we're supposed to be doing, right? In the express. Yeah. 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 Like, you yeah. know, like, it's like, um, I think like, you know, you know, I know Kanye's, you know, we're not supposed to be talking, but like when he's at his best producing, he does that with, with his references. Yeah, yeah. Right? have you seen that Netflix uh, documentary? He, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting to, I'm waiting. I'm, wait, I'm waiting. I yeah. need to have some time, but I want to watch Genius. Yeah, I've seen the first. I've seen the first two. It's okay, pretty, how old is it? it's pretty inspiring, man. Okay, I, I, yeah. I, mean, I think the I think the guy who's uh, who's doing the uh, the um, the documentary uh, the the filming of it, his narration sometimes is a little um, overwhelming, but uh, it's still like the footage. Uh, everything is worth it. It's worth it. But that's a that's a digression, you know. So <laughs> let's get back to you. Um, and, and so, yeah, speaking of genius, um, so with, um, uh, with the work that you're doing, um, not only in that poem, um, but I'm also thinking about the way in which, you know, we sort of talked about like pulling the threads through, right? And so like, um, I'll, let's just jump to the end and go to the last poem, um, which, which for me, um, I was ready to throw the book across the room, uh, even though it's on Kindle. Uh, so, uh, it kind of held me back. So, um, you know, for the black children at the end of the world in the beginning, um, I felt like this, I mean, I, when I, when I read this, I felt like I was reading, um, the last sonnet, that sonnet crown, like where you had pulled all the different lines from other poems and you brought them together in this, um, can you talk a bit about like where you were, like how you thought about closing the collection with this? Yeah, so I wrote this poem as like, to me, this was a poem that was directly in response to the uprisings that were happening in the summer of 2020. Oh. Uh, I got an email from Academy of American Poets and they were like, yo, we, you know, um, we're putting, pulling together stuff. Can you send us stuff? Oh. You know, what I noticed was everybody was addressing like Ford Motor Company everybody was putting out political stuff, every company, and we were all like consumed by who put out these statements, why are they putting them out now? And it became all yeah. about turning towards like capitalism and corporate America. And that's not who's being fucking injured, excuse my language, not being who's yeah. injured, right? Like who's being, in, who should we be addressing, right? We should be turning to children. We should be turning to each other, right? The children, in, we should be turning, it should be, yeah. you know? And so, uh, in Austin, it got serious. It was crunk out there. It, mm, was, mm. it was burning cars on the highway. They was what in Austin, dude. It was it was real. It was real Damn. in Austin, man. We yeah. They, it, I mean, they would shoot. They were shooting folks in the face. Like what? Folks, man, folks went blind. Like this every, wasn't just on the east side. No, no, no. This was this was downtown. We're talking Caesar Child. Wow. We're, we're talking like second. Right by the big hotels, but Damn. like walking right on right on Congress Avenue Bridge. Wow. You know, where wow. everybody goes wow. to see that. It was, mm. it was it was live. And so I was thinking about also what it was to like have a daughter. And and like normally Naima comes out to protest with me. Um, mm. always like since she was zero in Chicago, mm. have her out there and you know. Puerto Rican, you know, trying to free Puerto Rican political prisoners, you know, my mom's Puerto Rican, so he was out there, man. We always had her out there when we were protesting Trump. Now he was out there in the stroller, right? Because uh, <laughs> I, you know, like, this is us, that's what we do. And so yeah. I was really debating whether to take her because it was real live, but I was like, you know what? I gotta take her. And I had to write this poem <laughs> to be able to take mm -hmm, her. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, there's this really, you know, I, there's also this really great poem called Hey Black Child that I love. Um, 
that I was sort of citing and referencing, but I closed the book with this because in some ways, this is what I want. This is the world I want, right? Like this is the world I want to see where the, ch where the children are just like, like it connects back to children. Listen, like grow wildly over the grave, just become the thing that this country didn't want you to become, right? And so when I was thinking about it, I knew this was the last poem, right? Yeah. I knew this was the poem that, you know, we must, you know, this is the marching orders in some ways. This yeah, is yeah. Yeah, it feels like a call to action. I mean, you know, it's a, I mean, it's definitely a closer, you know. Um, you know, the, the thing you said about how um, when you first started writing, you weren't thinking, you were just writing poems. You weren't necessarily thinking like you're writing toward a theme. But um, it's so um, it's so clear that, you know, loss and thinking about the future, uh, which comes often in the form of children, that seems to be something that keeps coming around. You know, and structurally, I don't know. I mean, it might be, you know, like you're, you, you evoked, uh, you evoke Coltrane in here, uh, you know, quite a few, even, you know, when you bring in Naima, I have to think Coltrane then too, you know. And so like, when you, when you do that, you're also, you know, you, you talked about making these leaps and connections. Um, but beyond moving out and making those leaps, you also come back and it's, it keeps coming back and, and feeling grounded. And um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm just wondering, like, what do you think is the grounding factor, like the, the thing that you feel like really grounds the book and keeps it, um, you know, keeps it um, centered? Because, um, you know, if we talk in jazz, like, you, we know we can, you know, we can move out on a solo, but, you know, we always are thinking about, like, what key we're in, the chord changes, are they in, you know, they work with the, you know, harmony, harmony, you know, so, um, like, how do you think of, like, what grounded, what, I guess, what gave you the, the ability to be so nimble inside the structure of the mm -hmm. book? And because I think what happens with a lot of people is when they think about uh, putting a book together, that's one of the things that, um, they worry about is that, you know, I have all this stuff happening and, and I have all these poems I've been trying to pull together. Um, but I don't know if there's anything that's connecting them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I always ask my students to like, tell me what, what the book is about, which they hate, you know, cause you know what I mean? Cause especially if you're a poet. Um, but I do think you have to have a, a sense of that. And it's clear that you did in this collection. So I'm just wondering like, what is that grounding factor for you? So I think the grounding is definitely the music, right? Like I think the music can be a through line. You can carry like in many different ways of thinking about music from jazz, hip hop to like the traditional poetry, sort of music, alliteration, rhyme, form, meter, right? All of those things, couplets, right? All that is music, right? Um, the other thing that I think happened was it didn't come out whole cloth this way. So I started setting down poems and actually it was a friend of mine who, Somaz, uh, we oh. were like, we have to, we, so we started sending each other really large batches of poems. Mm. We would send them in like batches of 20 pages. And- Somaz like, Sharif. Somaz Sharif, yeah, the poet. Who also has a, has a new book out. Also. Great new book, Customs, go get it. Um, and we were just, we were just sending these, these things and she had a certain structure and it was helpful to hear how she was thinking about structure. So one of the things I would say is being in conversation with another poet was also super helpful. And then I began to say, well, what if I, what if I play with, what if I play with music? What if music becomes the, the through line? What if I play with, so if our structure is, oh, what about jazz? What, you know, like, I know a little something about that. I know a little something about jazz. And, and so what I did was I actually laid it out. And as I laid it on the floor, I realized, oh, I need another soul. Oh, so you laid it out physically. I physically laid it on the floor. I always yeah, it. yeah. Right. Okay. So I so I saw domestic work and I was like, oh, I have this other poem that's I need to finish. Uh -huh. And it's and it and not because there was a gap. And I said, oh, yeah. that's where this solo goes. And then when I was, I had the first section down, I had the solos, I'm doing the last section. And I was like, oh, what if I do this? And then what if I do this? Right. So there's a way in which uh -huh. it, had to be physical, right? It, it was the drafting, right? It was, yeah. it was with the book and really thinking about, oh, this poem can talk back to this poem. It can move this 
ahead and then wait. And I rewrote stuff. Like, I literally was like, oh, this poem doesn't work here anymore. <laughs> Get that out of here. Mm. Let's do this. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it makes, makes, makes great sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so um, audience. Now let me yeah, let me check and see if we got any questions here. Um, you all have some questions. You can put them in, put them in. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking to, to Roger about jazz. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any yet, but I'll, I'll keep an eye out. I'll okay. keep an eye out. Um, so anyway, um, you know, one of the uh, I mean, I'll just go back to the book because I you know the thing is um, digging into. Uh, the collection itself is, 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 I mean, you know, we can't go wrong with that. Um, so the, um, the future from beyond the voice of God, um, you know, I mean, you know, so there's so many references here um, and, um, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm, I'm wondering in this one, when I was reading it, I was thinking, man, I mean, um, you know, there's so many connections that I necessarily wouldn't necessarily think would come together in this po in, in this in this poem, but they all, um, you know, they all dance together in it. And mm -hmm. so, um, can you tell me a little bit about like like structuring this and um, you know, um, you know, bringing these tercets together? Um, with all these different, I mean, this is a this is a poem that really does take um, various strands and uh, and kind of braids them together. Um, philosophy, poetry, uh, political philosophy. Um, you know, you got Stein, you got Cezaire. I mean, it's, it's so much happening here. Yves Saint Laurent. <laughs> you know, what I mean, so I mean, uh, tell tell me a little bit about this. It's so funny because this poem is kind of like. I had written seven other pages before I got to this. And this is wow. the only one that, so this is like 10 pages. This, this is the like one or two that came out of. Yeah. Like, and so what it was is I think it's a type of like, I've been, I'm, so when I use the tercet, right? Mm -hmm. I use the tercet on purpose. And the way I set it out is to me, okay, what is the most modern, I thought about what is the most modern container? What is one of the most, when I was writing it, one of the most, and so I was thinking about how I would, and I was also thinking of what were words I would never use in a poem. And the word I would never use in a poem is selfie, hmm. right? And, but I would use the term self-portrait, which is what selfie is, right? Yeah. I had a bunch of self-portraits in King Me. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. Cause I think the selfie in relationship to social media is the most, it's, it's the most recent historical container. Hmm. So when hmm. you think about a historical container, that means that everything that has come before can fit inside of it. And so that's why I'm like selfies of this, selfies of things that wouldn't normally be selfies, right? It starts off selfie of that, selfie of that, right? Because people are also, one of the things that happens is when you have a child, people be like, send me a picture, send me a picture. You be like, I want to mm -hmm. take, like, I'm not the picture taking guy. Like, that's not, I'm not gonna take pictures. Yeah. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you how she's doing. I'll give you a call. I'll talk on the phone with you for an hour, but I'm not gonna take no pictures. Yeah. Um, so I started thinking about like all these disparate things. And then again, this is sort of beat making when I think of like, uh, again, like um, Ninth Wonder, right? Mm. And the way he takes like Boney J. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, so I was like, oh, if I, were making, if I were making a beat, if I were chopping up different elements to yeah. make a beat, and I think about Ludwig Gordonson, who does, um, you, we know him as the, the producer for Childish Gambino's Redbone. Uh, okay. a lot of scores but if you look at that like I, I study like kind of producers and the way they make mm, it, mm. and I'm really interested in the way they can be like I took this little element here and I took this element here yeah and this element here and they take 27 28 60 elements and all of a sudden it feels so cohesive because of the way they've moved it together and so that's the way I thought about this poem right so the tercet is the container kind of like yeah. the yeah and then if you know like I'm a you know I kind of have a surrealist uh, been to me so I'm going to like put people and things in conversation that that would have been yeah like, yeah, really yeah those disparate connections yeah Richard Stein is living and making at the same time that Cesare is and they're both in some mm. ways about certain types of upheaval right so mm. I'm thinking about what would happen if they met because we know Picasso met Cesare we have you know a very bad portrait of yeah. Cesare that he's he yeah. made right 
And we also know that Picasso knew Gertrude Stein. So boom, right? Like, so to me, it's like, mm, mm, mm. People, right? They're, they're already in the same artistic atmosphere. Right? Yeah, so yeah. Either, like, this is what hip hop, right? Like, I think like, this is why. I, it's also like you said about the selfie though. Yeah. Cause it's like, he, cause you have the thing in the, in the foreground but there's all this, you know, data in the background as well. And you're kind of, you know, in that same way, bringing all that together here. Bookshelf too. I'm looking at your bookshelves and I'm thinking about how like the bookshelf is the most surrealist sort of uh, in, a, in a historical document, right? Like yeah. everybody's bookshelf is going to be really different. So I just thought, what if I brought like my bookshelf out of my head, out of the room, mm. and put it right? That's it's me playing, right? Like it's just like right. you know, as a kid, I used to make book. I used to make these book forts, and I would and I would just have you know. And I think that in some ways, this is like a fort I'm making, right? A fort of sound. So. Cool, cool. Oh, we got some questions. Let me let me see what we got here. Um, in a Miles recording, I think Stockholm Coltrane does a brief interview where he shuns away from any praise and insists that he's searching to make uh, to make his sound more lyrical. How do you interpret this statement in the field of the page? Uh, you may have answered this in a way already. So how do I think about like sound in relationship to the page? I think there's so like, I've done, I'll say this, I've done like a quarter of what I think I can do on the page in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is there's so much that can be done, right? I think of like M. Norbessi Phillips as, and what she does uh -huh. as thinking about the feel of the page and sort of things coming yeah, apart, right? Here. right? Um, I think about what I do with citationality in the page. Uh -huh. um, like I pull in from Sun Ra's biography in this book, right? Uh -huh. um, so to me, I think I am looking for uh, a sort of lyrical, I am trying to get at a sound. I'm trying to get at like, I remember Terrence Hayes said this thing to me that's really important. He said to me, he was like, I don't know if Nina Simone is a great singer but she sounds so much like herself, it doesn't matter. And I think that's what I'm trying to do with thinking about the page, thinking about, so yeah. like what I'm, and I'm also interested in like compression and seeing what types of explosions that we can get. Um, so that's, that's one way. So to me, uh, there's many ways. I mean, I think like, the, like I'm interested in like bringing back the physical poem and bringing back chanting. Yeah. Um, I've been really thinking of, I've been working with poems that chant now. Yeah. Um, and so I've been thinking about how can we sort of chant on the page? What does something like a political cry, like si se puede, or yes, we can. What is, how do we think about that on the page? And what, you know, what is sort of the poetics of that type of repetition, uh -huh. right? Um, which also gets me to the moan. I'm really interested in moaning on the page. I heard that, yeah. You know, so, yeah. yeah. I hope that sort of answers. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Um, Oh, this is from another great poet, Joy Priest. Joy. <laughs> Roger, you're the type of poet who has a mind like a library. Nikki Finney always talks about the importance of a reference library for poets. What's your reference process like? Is collecting random information important to you? And how do you get it into poems? I'm thinking about Alice Coltrane, her harp fills in the cracks of me with gold. The Japanese call it kins kinsugi. Mm -hmm. uh, also, related, can you talk about the gold in this collection? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm pull that question up because I'm going to answer all the parts of it. Uh, what's your reference process like? So, I'm always taking down quotes. Uh, like uh, I read, there's this quote uh, that I'm that I've been really fascinated with from Wordsworth that's in a ta table's turn, which is a poem where Wordsworth is like, hey, get, stop reading books, go out into the world, go out into nature and experience nature. There's the book, right? But he says, we murder to dissect. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. we murder to dissect. I was really like, oh, that's a really fascinating sort of way of thinking. So I've just been sort of pondering that. I'm always just like catching little snatches of things um, and writing them down. Uh, like for instance, in the poem, uh, Rich Black or Best Barbarian in the book, that uh, the end of that actually comes from 
the sort of form of that comes from Ame Césaire writing about Wilfredo Lamb, the Cuban surrealist poet, black Afro-Cuban surrealist poet. And I happened to be in Spain um, and they had this retrospective of Wilfredo Lamb's work. So we all know Wilfredo Lamb's work. I'm gonna tell you how you know it if you don't know his name. Look at any Yusuf Komiyaka book. The cover is Wilfredo <laughs> Lamb painting, right? He loves Wilfredo Lamb. He's on most of his book covers. Um, and so, and I, I was like, oh, I was in the museum. I was like, oh, these are like Yusuf Komiyaka's covers. And they were, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the end of the exhibit, the last thing when you walk out in French and in Spanish is Ame Césaire writing about Wilfredo Lamb. And if I see anything Ame Césaire writes, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop. I had never seen this and it was an, and it was beautiful. He's, he said, you know, Wilfredo Lamb addresses himself to the Yano, which is a type of Caribbean, to this Caribbean animal, to all these different animals, trees, but most of all, he addresses himself to freedom. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to address yeah. myself only to freedom, right? So that's the way I think about quoting, right? And that's on discourse, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so like, I and I saw that quote years before I ever, you, you know, sort of misshaped it um, mm -hmm. to use it. So that's how I think about, uh, sort of quoting um, gold. So I think that comes from like growing up in a Pentecostal church uh, and thinking about gold in terms of, uh, you know, everything becomes about, he heaven becomes about gold, right? It becomes about the afterlife, right? So gold in some ways signals to me afterlife and a type of beauty in the afterlife. But it also is like, I think about Trinidad James, right? Gold all in my watch, right? Like, I just love, like, I love the way hip hop uses gold, right? Like, I think it's real, like Kanye say, you know, like it's in our souls to love gold, you know? And so I always love the idea of like playing with gold, right? And the golden calf, right, is also kind of a profligate image from the Bible, right? You're not supposed to, but like, you know, you're not supposed to, but gold in some ways is barbaric, right? That's the, like to love gold is to kind of be an idolater, right? To be a barbarian. And so like, to me, there's all these, like, I think gold is, you know, like, I mean, co colonization moves on gold, right? Whole, whole countries and peoples were decimated over gold, right? So I just think that gold, there's, there's something about gold. And I just want to sort of play in all these ways that gold is used in, black, in the black community and black culture. And then also thinking about gold as something that can, that can heal. Right, that can heal a crack. And there's a really good artist uh, who, if you look him up, he took gold plating and filled in the cracks of a basketball court in LA. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, I can't think of his name now. I think it's Victor something. And he like puts gold, gold all in the cracks and then he paints the court white. And he has like this, beautiful, it's, it's really, really awesome. Uh, and so I thought about, so that's where that image comes from, is this artist who like literally put gold in the crack. So I'm always just wow. looking. Wow. I mean, this, this, this kind of brings us back to the title, Best Barbarian, because I, you know, I, I hear that, I think about the Battle of Alcazar and how, you know, barbarian, it wasn't necessarily thought of as being, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a brute. It mm -hmm. was, you know, uh, it was royalty. You know, and the look, you know, just people from an area and uh, you know, in a culture, mm -hmm. and so you're sort of bringing that back, and um, a culture that was rich in um, you know, precious metals and stones. So uh, it's, it's wonderful. Um, let me see. Let me make sure we don't have another question before I ask you. Yeah, good. So um, the the one thing I was going to ask you is about the solo mm -hmm. and sustaining the solo, <laughs> but the long slash epic poem i know um uh you you your your next collection probably that you you've been working on this this long poem i see vestiges of that in this book mm -hmm. um so can you talk a little bit about like how to sustain that solo how to write that long poem how to you sure. know the epic yeah i think when i'm thinking about it's so funny because i think I, i'm pra i was practicing for the long thing in, in some ways. I think I'm, I'm moving towards longer, longer stuff, even as I'm trying to like, I'm also playing with short stuff too right now. But one of the things I think is the way I ground it. So for instance, in something about John Coltrane, I like the term something about, that seems really black. Yeah. Like that, something about, da, 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 da. <laughs> something about this, that man over there, something about, you know? And so I think I, that phrase for me feels like a way of like rounding, 
right? Where you can go way, way, way off and then you can say something about, and that becomes like, if there's a balloon, that's the string that tethers it to the wrist, right? So that balloon can go really, really far, but as long as you have that string, it brings it back. So that's one way, right? And so in that way, it's like a refrain, right? So that's very old school, uh, right? And then there's a, this other thing that I've been thinking about, which is time, right? Um, so I'm working on this long, I don't, I don't wanna give it away too much, but I've been using time as an anchor, right? Um, so that things can happen, things can wildly happen. But if there's like a time structure, then we know that all of this happened within this thing. And even as wild we can get, and the time structure can be fuzzed with, right? We can skip days, we can move ahead, we can move behind, right? But as long as we have time, right? And this is this thing that film teaches us, you know, Van, you're, you know, like, Time is so important, right? Like we can jump, we can jump perspectives, we can jump literal years in a movie, right? And we know it for some reason. We sometimes just know it, but it's about, right? Sort of how do we how have we grounded time? So that's one way I'm thinking about it. Um, and then another way is obviously an epic is the guide, right? Mm -hmm. Someone moving us through. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Dante, right? And um, you know, sequentially, right? But there's a way in which I want to play with the lyric. Bit, right and I think you know a great example of this is like Bridget McGee Kelly's song right? uh, lyric yeah. everybody interprets as a, like a narrative poem but it's not it's actually a lyric poem it's definitely and it leaps lyric. yeah 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 um we have uh one 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 last question um here uh from Jacob Boyd uh Jacob. Speak, hey, Jacob. Yeah, he asked a question earlier too. Um, speaking of the title and the primacy of imagery, I'd love to hear you talk about the cover and selecting that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I didn't want any body. I didn't want any physical, like human bodies on the cover. Um, and I wanted something that was, but something that's sort of like, if you look at Prayer of the Jaguar, right there, this sort of corresponds to that poem, right? The idea of like leaping at your enemy with your mouth with like full fangs oh. um, and i uh so i wanted something like that and i so the cover was about sort of thinking about metaphor right um and the sort of like i'm really like there's this quote i've been obsessed with from thoreau um which is first you must be a good animal oh. and, and I, so I've always think about like the animal and in some ways the jaguar is an animal that I, I, I really love. Um, it's, an, it's an animal that I've always loved um, since I was a little kid. So I wanted something like that, that type of mouth. Um, it's sort of opening on the best barbarian, consuming it, being the best barbarian. And that really that term is not like king me and king me that king me is different, but best barbarian is not saying I am best barbarian. But it's the idea that the the the, the, hum, the human the best human is the barbarian. So wow. Grendel Grendel brought the best version of humans to themselves, right? Um, yeah. Grendel's mother is the mother that I want, right? That mother that comes down out of the hills ready to tear tear a new one into everybody, right? Um, hmm. So to me, that's what I'm. Um, that's what I'm. That's what what the cover of significance is. Yeah. Also, I like red. I, I, I normally don't go red. Um, there's an inside joke on that, if, if you know what fraternity I'm in. Um, but uh, <laughs> A Phi A, you know, you know what Oh, my God. I was about to say, man. <laughs> you know, but you know, uh, you know better than do that to me, man. <laughs> I know, I know. There's, no, there's only crimson. I don't know anything about any red. <laughs> <laughs> no inside joke. I was like, look. <laughs> so, no, but I love, I love red. You know, I love red. So I was like, let me, let me put red on the cover. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I think I think we're I think we're at time, man. But this has been, you know, it's a, it's a great cover, great book, uh, brilliant work, brother. Thank you, uh, thank you for putting this in the world, and, and thanks for this time tonight. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be in conversation with you, and it, it means so much that you've cared for me and my book this way. Thank you. Always, always. And thank you, thank Green. You, everyone. Thank oh. you.
Thank yeah. you both so much. This was such a beautiful conversation. Um, to those of you that are here and want to share it, this will be available on YouTube um, within the next couple of days. I know that there are already questions that people want to already watch it again. Um, so it'll be there. Um, thank you for being here. Make sure to pick up a copy um, at Greenlight, preferably. And um, have a great night, everybody. Thanks again.